morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Susan Moore, president of Friends of the Salmon River, and this, of course, is our annual general meeting. Thanks so much for coming. We're already up to 120 participants, and I think there are still people coming in, but I think we'll go ahead because we've got a pretty full agenda for tonight. Um, if you have, um, you can see that we did mute people as they came, uh, as they came into the meeting. Um, can you just make sure that you keep yourself muted only because we're not telling you to be quiet. <laughs> it's only because um, sometimes you get very strange pops and clicks from people's phones and it's a bit distracting. And if you have a dog barking in the background, <laughs> we won't need to hear it. So thanks very much for coming. We are on our very first new winter speaker series. That's 2021 and 22. And you probably, many of you, I'm sure, came to our series last year um, when we started this winter speaker series. And it was so popular and we had so many people attending that we decided to reinvent it for this year. So this is, in fact, the first um, event. Uh, we're happy to be partnered with Friends of the Napanee River. We know there are folks on also from Friends of Wilton Creek Watershed and supporters of the Hastings Stewardship Council. So welcome to all of them. Thanks very much to uh, Lawrence O'Keefe and Art Dunham for their help. And also to my husband, Stephen Moore, whose Zoom platform we are on and he handled all the registrations. There's our agenda. Um, all our presentations in this winter speaker series will be recorded and made into YouTube videos, just like last session. We will send you the link to this recording in a day or two. It will go to everyone registered and to our outreach email list. It will also be posted on our Friends of Salmon and Friends of Napanee website, so, you can, um, so it can always be watched at any time. So uh, tonight's, re uh, tonight's feature presentation will, of course, be um, Michael Runtz. Um, but before we get to Michael's presentation, we have a little bit of uh, AGM information to uh, give to you. But it won't be long before we get on to Michael. The board members of Friends of the Salmon River are myself as president, Vice President Joan King, Treasurer Dave Johnson, who you'll see later, Secretary Amanda Tracy, who you'll also see. Other directors are Victor Hayes, Liz Hughes, Herb Pillays, Phil Couton, Stephanie Wright, and Beth Wiley. As it turns out this year, all of us are planning on staying on the board, which means we're not having an election this year. However, please do let us know if you have interest in a future board uh, position or you would like to be on a committee and we will certainly try and fit you in. The president's report has been emailed to all of the membership. So most of you should have that um, um, as an email and that gives you a report on all our activities um, for the last year. Memberships, I'm just going to say a couple of quick, a quick mention about memberships for Friends of the Salmon River. If you want to purchase or renew, you can either, you can go to our website and use either a credit card or PayPal, or you can contact our treasurer and arrange to mail a check to him. And if you would like to become a member of Friends of the Napanee River, there's how you do it. You can as well, go to their website, use PayPal or credit card, or you can contact their treasurer to arrange a check as well. Our next event, I think the graphic kind of says it all, dynamited, damaged, or destroyed an explosive history of the upper Napanee River. That will also be the Friends of Napanee River AGM. So that's our um, upcoming, uh, uh, up, upcoming um, event on Tuesday, December 7th at 7 p.m. Should be very exciting to say the least. Um, oh, and note too that all, um, all events from now on will actually be on Tuesday nights. This is the only one on a Monday.
I think that's everything we had to tell you. Um, so Michael's presentation will be next. Let me remind you or tell you, um, if you have questions during the session, please use the Zoom chat function uh, lower right on your screen and just type in your questions or comments and you can direct your questions to everyone. And those questions will be collected and given to Michael at the end of the at the end of his slide presentation. The other reminder is if you haven't already, go to the top right of your screen under view and select speaker view, because then you will get Michael's presentation on a um, full screen, which we which you definitely will want. Okay, um, af right after Michael's presentation, then obviously will be the question and answer session with him. Um, when he's done, or when we're done with that, um, please stay tuned because there will be a little bit of remaining um, annual general meeting information to come to you, including a 30-second clip of the new Salmon River video, which has now been produced. So that will be kind of exciting. I am now going to call on Amanda Tracy. And Amanda, if you can unmute yourself, I will get you to introduce our speaker. Great, thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to welcome Michael Runtz to our Friends of the Salmon River annual general meeting this evening. Uh, Michael has been associated with Algonquin Park for nearly 50 years. Uh, and that includes 11 seasons uh, working as an interpretive naturalist for the park. He's hosted uh, the international television series, um, Wild by Nature, and he's authored and uh, illustrated 14 different natural history books, including uh, Algonquin Wild and his two latest uh, books, Wildflowers of Algonquin Park, which are of Algonquin Provincial Park, which I look forward to checking out, and uh, The Explorer's Guide to Algonquin Park, the fourth edition. Uh, he also provided the images for the award-winning children's book, uh, At Home with the Beaver. And he also wrote Dam Builders, The Natural History of Beavers and Their Ponds. He's written an astounding more than 1,100 uh, natural history articles for newspapers, magazines. And he teaches natural history and ornithology courses at Carleton University. And uh, he's taught more than uh, 56,000 uh, students in his time there. Uh, he's received numerous awards, including um, awards for public science education, uh, as well as um, university teaching achievement awards. Uh, and Michael really is a teacher in and outside of the classroom. I actually first found out about Michael uh, from his Facebook page, where he shares lots of uh, great information and photos about everything uh, nature related. And um, I've certainly learned a lot from Michael about nature on his Facebook page, so I encourage everybody to check him out, and that would be at uh, Nature by Runtz. So uh, without further ado, I will pass it over to Michael. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. And uh, I think without any further ado, I'll start the presentation. So let me just, oh, apparently you're not letting me share the screen. So I need someone to allow me to share the screen. And okay, I'm not sure what's happening here, but Hopefully this is going to. Now, can everybody see that? Is that working, Amanda? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, good. Well, I'll start them without further ado. Anyways, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to the annual general meeting of a very important group, the Friends of the Salmon River. Um, and I understand there's a few people who are going to be watching or participating that are not members. So for those of you who are not members of the, of the Friends, uh, please consider joining, or at the very least, a contribution toward their great efforts would be much appreciated. Um, and without further ado, we'll start the presentation then. So this talk is not about the Salmon River specifically. It is about wetlands and, and waterways in general, 
uh, and how they're interconnected. Because when you think about the Salmon River, you think about many different aspects, ranging from peatlands to marshes to lakes and so on. And so uh, the theme of this talk will certainly be water, but water in all forms. And all watersheds start with, with uh, small streams and springs and lakes leading down to larger streams and creeks. And the water flowing eventually into larger rivers and to lakes and so on. And so much of what is in the water depends on the land around. And that's a very important feature that the Friends of the Salmon River have been uh, th doing for years, and that's trying to get the preservation of the habitats around the waterways preserved because they have a, a profound effect on the quality of the water and what is found inside there. Um, so the land surrounding, especially the highlands from which start the watershed off to begin with, um, really have this great effect. If you look at the Salmon River, for example, it doesn't start down near Napanee, where it flows out to eventually, or in that area near Shannonville, but up much farther. And in fact, the waterways travel across two very different parts of Ontario in terms of geology. It starts up in the Canadian Shield and goes down through sedimentary limestone, much younger rock. The older rock where the waters begin are generally very acidic, very old, about 2 billion years old, very hard. And they don't contribute too much in terms of resources to the water. Granites are pretty common. So are gneissic rocks, which are transformed granites and similar rock. They're metamorphosed by heat and pressure into what we call uh, nice, for example. So this is one nice eye here you're seeing in terms of what rock type that is. The rocks journey are on acidic soil and they make it more acidic by the contribution of minerals. And then we find these plants that thrive in those conditions like marginal shield fern, to Pipsissawa, a northern wildflower, and many, many others. And the southern part of the watershed, the water flows over and through limestone rock, which is much softer and full of calcium. And that allows plants that thrive in calcifilic areas like this, this uh, fragile fern and, uh, and fringe gentian to grow, which are not really found on the shield, except in rare occasions. And of course, a plant you're all very familiar with, poison ivy, thrives wherever there's calcium. And so you tend to find this plant very commonly in the southern part of the watershed, but not so much up on the Canadian Shield. So water is the theme. And again, the, the quality of the land around the water really influences what that water is like. And of course, water varies tremendously in terms of not only a nutrient content, but also in flow. And, uh, and general characteristics. I'm gonna start up north, where you get these northern peatlands associated with the water. And these peatlands are generally fairly uh, uh, nutrient poor. Um, there's two major groups, there are bogs, which we see here, and fens. And they're very similar in plant composition. Um, usually though, in terms of uh, mineral input, bogs only get it from rainfall, while fens get it from moving water either coming through as a stream or from groundwater flowing in. So there are subtle differences. But nonetheless, they still have a habitat where the plants themselves form the soil, it's organic soil. And these harbor a lot of really special plants and animals. For example, the smallest dragonfly in North America, second smallest in the world, is found in these peatlands. It's called the elfin skimmer. And that's the male, and the female looks very much like a little bee. And these dragonflies, by the way, don't fly around in the air above your head. They're down at knee level or below, usually drifting amongst the sedges and the peatland plants like leatherleaf and so on that are growing down there. There are other dragonflies too you find in this habitat. Crimson ringed whiteface, one of my favorites. It's resting here on an orchid. And by the way, a lot of these peatlands do harbor orchids. Uh, Rose pagonia is one of the most common. And looking a bit like it, but with the lower landing platform for insects held above the other petals is grass pink or calipogon. And this is a really neat orchid, by the way, because it's got a fake 
a set of stamens here with pollen, that B C. And they think they can land here and get pollen, so they land here. But the weight of the bee causes that whole petal to collapse. It's on a hinge right here. And down comes the bee on its back in this little winged trough that contains the plant's sexual parts. And as the poor bee struggles to get out, climbing, you know, upside down, uh, it uh, picks up pollen and leaves pollen behind if it's bearing pollen from another grass pink. Very fantastic orchid for its pollination biology. There are other flowers too in these peatlands that have a strange way of getting nutrients. There are carnivorous plants. They're called carnivorous, which I suppose is partly true because they do capture in some cases larger animals like salamanders, but for the most part they're capturing insects, especially the tiny sun, uh, sundews whose leaf traps are the size of your perhaps thumbnail. And uh, on the leaf pad are these modified hairs coming out that create a ball of glue at the end to which the insects get stuck. And the, when, when an insect is captured by this flower, by the leaves, they very slowly fold over, holding the insect against the middle hairs here that release the enzymes of digestion. So a very lethal trap that's like sticky glue paper or like sticky fly paper, I guess, uh, out in the peatlands, right down on the bog mat or fen mat. The largest of the so-called carnivorous plants are the pitcher plants, and I love these guys. Like the name suggests, the pitcher, the modified leaf, holds rainwater, and it's open at the top like a vase, and you'll see all these little hairs pointing downwards here. When an insect is drawn by the patterns and lands on top of this open pouch, it starts climbing down. And as it hits the inside part here, all of a sudden the hairs end, it's a smooth, slippery slide, and down they go into the water where they drown. So here's a view looking down into the pitcher plant. And the curvature of that uh, pitcher makes it almost impossible for the insect to fly back out again. It's a beautiful design. The insect drowns, and if it's a young leaf just starting off, it has enzymes released into the water that digest the insects. But if it's an older leaf, it stops making those enzymes. And in fact, the living world down here of protozoans and bacteria that eventually get started do the digestion for the plant itself. Wonderful plant, the pitcher plant. Now, if you get a chance, you're on a peatland, look inside the pitchers. You might find a surprise. And that surprise is this fantastic fly grub that actually survives the, the acid bath or whatever is inside those, the, the, the water inside the leaf. It survives that and feeds on drowned insects. You can see the breathing tubes all through this, this flesh fly. And uh, the female fly lays an egg in the pitcher and that egg hatches to this larvae, which then survives and devours whatever comes in of any size. And then eventually will pupate and fly out of the pitcher unscathed. So in nature, there's never an opportunity wasted or, or missed. And here inside the pitcher plant, this wonderful soup developing of dissolving insects provides nutrition for not only this flash fly, but other flies too, including mosquito. Um, bogs and fens are pretty well still water habitats. And I'm gonna jump to the next, to the real big one, big still water habitat. And that of course uh, is a lake. And lakes are dynamic habitats and they can really change their appearance, can't they? They can be calm and peaceful. They can be beautiful at sunset or downright scary when the storm comes up. And they are living entities. Um, in summer, when there's, when there's a lot of uh, sunshine and, and warm temperatures, the lake gets layered in different uh, uh, temperature regimes. And, uh, and that's sort of all the way it is through summertime. But then in fall, and again in spring when the ice is coming off, winds start churning the water and it becomes all mixed up. And the top water goes to the bottom, the bottom water comes to the top, it's a turnover. And when that happens, this brings down oxygen to the lower part of the lake and brings up the nutrients to the upper part of the lake. And it's quite a, a phenomenon that occurs twice a year, twice annually. So here's the fall turnover. 
Not quite as tasty as a spring turnip over, but it does the trick for distributing oxygen and nutrients through the water itself. Now, when you go to a lake, there's some obvious organisms that, that uh, benefit from that habitat, things like bald eagle and so on. So there are a number of large animals that we see and appreciate. And on the shoreline, maybe you'll encounter a spotted spider bobbing around on the rocks or on the shoreline. But those are obvious. Most of the life in a lake is hidden down below. And not just the fish, but much smaller organisms thrive down by the bottom. Sometimes we see them when the water gets low. You can see these wonderful cryptic trails all through the what was mud. Those are caused, of course, by clams. And clams are a really important part of a lake because they filter their food from the water. And in doing so, they filter out nasty things from the water that, that uh, could harm other organisms. They, they clean the water. And the clam fauna in a lake can recycle 80 or 90% of the water in one lake in one entire year. That's how important these creatures are. And of course, they're very diverse, and some species live in shallower water, some in deeper water. They have different requirements. And uh, fortunately for their friends of the Salmon River, uh, they've got an expert uh, locally to, to call upon. And, uh, and if you have any questions on clams or their incredible life cycle, which includes being parasitic on fish gills as a larva, uh, then uh, there's certainly a person to contact. So we have all these organisms down at the bottom, but even smaller are the larval stages of flies called midges. There are a number of different flies who uh, live in the bottom sediments in their larval stage, and they play important roles in decomposing and so on. And of course, when they finally come to the surface and the pupal cake and emerge as a flying insect, they are important food for a lot of other organisms. In the water, they serve as food for small fish. In the air, they serve as food for uh, uh, flying uh, birds like swallows and things like that. And of course, larger insects will eat them too. So fish then, of course, are an important part of the lake ecosystem. And in the lake, you find animals that eat fish. Common loons, of course, are found on most lakes of any size. We see their nests by the shore. They build up a, a mud platform usually and uh, lay their one or two eggs on that. After 29 days, the eggs hatch. In this case, they only had one young, but the little baby comes out and immediately takes to the water and joins the parents and often takes rides on the parents' backs. Even as they get a bit larger in size, they continue to sit in the parents' back. And when they get hungry, they nibble on the feathers. And that tells the parents to get to work. And they soon bring up tiny little fish and minnows for the little guy or little guys to eat. There are also ducks that eat fish that are found on many lakes too, especially common regancers. Now, a lot of you have seen common regancers, and you probably notice that in the spring, they pair up pretty quickly as soon as the ice is off, and they move around as a pair. But then all of a sudden, the males <coughs> vanish. They are gone. The females are left to hatch the eggs by themselves and uh, raise the young. And so you commonly see females in summer with their babies in tow, but you don't see the males. Where have the males gone? Have you, have you ever wondered where they go? Well, the males leave en masse and they head up north and they form huge groups in James Bay and Hudson Bay where they spend the summer. They have never seen this part of Ontario in, in summertime. So the males get together and they go fishing and they tell stories, have a wonderful time, totally free of any uh, responsibility in terms of raising young. We, we see them on the return though in November usually, and many of our lakes uh, in our area will have huge numbers of male mergansers amassing on their way down to the Atlantic Ocean or large inland lakes farther south. Now lakes are considered still water systems, but yet by the shoreline, especially in bays, you get some current moving and therefore, you do get some plants growing in the water on the water's edge <coughs> that like a little bit of current. And certainly pickerel weed is one of these. And uh, these are fascinating flowers, by the way, because if you examine them closely, 
you'll see that each plant has one type of flower on it, but there are three types of flowers. And the three types are differentiated by the sexual parts. They always have two sets of stamens and a, a stigma. And the stigma can be hidden down here with a medium length and a longer length of stamens or a, mi a medium a length a stigma up here or a tall stigma. So there are three forms of pickerel weed flowers all based on the length of the sexual parts. And one, one type cannot pollinate that same type. It's got to be to a different type. So pollen is going to be transferred from one form to another form, which makes one entire plant impossible to self-pollinate by itself. So moving water then has a little bit of similarity to lakes but primarily in terms of in shallow bays by the edges. Moving water is a whole different habitat because the animals and plants there must deal with current. And if you go to spots like this where there's lots of stones and some current flowing through, there are a number of animals that are living as larvae usually under those rocks. And also behind the rocks there's a sheltered area for small organisms, including small fish and in some cases, larger fish if you're in less of a current. So it's very important, by the way, for people not to go into these streams and start piling up rocks to form a nookshooks. They destroy essential habitat that's there naturally, and many, many animals depend on that habitat. Including not the mosquito up here, because they like still water for laying their leg, eggs, especially in damp spots in the forest, but the little fellow down here, the black fly, they love flowing water. They love it. Here's a closer view. Aren't they amazing little flies? Only the females draw blood. They do so for egg development. And they have wonderful mandibles that slice into your skin. Into that slit, they put in anticoagulants, so your blood flows pretty readily. And uh, a lot of people avoid going to northern areas because of black flies. Because they, when they find you by your carbon dioxide and your water vapor gradients, they come in by the hundreds, even thousands. And they are known to drive some people crazy. <laughs> I don't use your pellets. I'm not sure you can tell that or not. But uh, I go into black fly country regularly and I just uh, pay the consequence. But to me, it's not sh suffering really. It's just paying the price of admission. And the shows that go on in our northern waterways are so spectacular. It's a very, very small price to pay indeed. I'm lucky though, after all the years of being exposed to black flies, these little bites only last me for a day or two at most, and they're gone. For a lot of people, of course, uh, there's a stronger reaction. It just means you need more exposure. So next year, go out there and spend day after day without repellents. And maybe through time, you'll get a little bit of resistance to uh, the effects of their bites. The larvae, though, are the ones that like the water. And they form a little pattern on a rock, and they have hooks that go into it, and they drift in the current, and they sort of drift out. And the way they feed is remarkable. They have the, on the top of the, near the mouth parts, or part of the modified mouth parts, they've got these things called labral brushes. They're like umbrellas, they open up in the current, they pick up organic matter uh, floating by, and they pull that into their mouth. And they, they do it repeatedly. They pulsate. And they spend then a, about a year in the water. And then uh, when spring temperatures get the water a bit warmer, out they come, of course, as biting insects. Other animals exploit the water's current to feed in that water. If you go to a shallow set of rapids where the water is flowing through, you often find these beautiful, uh, uh, these uh, net spinning caddisflies here. Uh, the trumpet nets are often called. And they're like a trumpet with an open end facing up into the current, the water flows through and traps organic matter, including some living things as well, down here where the larvae resides and feeds on them. What an amazing silk trap it makes. And these are very, very commonly seen in shallow rapids. The adults are flying insects. And while you don't generally see them very often like this, you, there are swarms sometimes, you can encounter mating swarms where they're dancing around. A lot of flying insects spend part of their life, or a large part of their life actually, in the water as a larvae, showing how important water is in terms of providing uh, bases for food chains and food webs. 
Another animal that's found in, in uh, flowing water that you'll see in the, this watershed and many other watersheds is a very strange animal indeed. It's a colonial animal and it's a freshwater sponge. And it feeds by water passing through its system and filtering out the organic matter. And it can appear almost like fingers. It can also appear in larger forms too. This is a, on my paddle uh, somewhere down near Kingston. I forget what river I was on, but it was near Kingston. And this was the, the, the sponge I picked up and soon put back in the water again. Fast flowing water has its own set of odonates of dragonflies and damselflies. And these often perch on rocks in the current and fly out quickly over the water. One of the most beautiful ones, in my opinion, are the snake tails. This is the rusty snake tail, a male with the swollen back end here that identifies it as a male. Plus the coloration too, spectacular. There are smaller members of that group also that fly over the flowing water. These are damselflies. And the stream bluette is one of the most common ones. Here I am on top of a bridge looking down, taking a photograph, hence the shadow down below. And these are pretty fast, so it's, they're a fun challenge to try to photograph in flight. Also, if the current's slow enough, you'll find many, many of these uh, sitting on rocks in the water on the shore. These are the powdered dancers, and the male powder dancer is uh, looking like this, and here's a female. And dragonflies and damselflies have a unique mating system oops, in which the, uh, uh, the male has claspers at the back end of his abdomen that fit into slots and behind the female's head. And when the female is ready for mating, she'll curl her abdomen right around up to a holding chamber here where the male has passed his sperm from down here up to here by himself, by, by bending around himself and implanting the sperm here. That's called the wheel position. We'll see a bit later on in a dragonfly. But these have already made it, and now she's ready for egg laying. And in some species of damselflies and dragonflies, they stay coupled together as a pair while ovipositing, while laying their eggs. And in the case of the powder dancer, they often go to floating vegetation in the current, and the female will dip her abdomen down she has a little slicing tool here for cutting a, a little spot inside a plant and implanting the egg into it. Now, with her in the current on this beautiful, beautiful sedge called the swaying bull, bulrush, if you're going over in terms of uh, 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 in a canoe or I suppose a kayak over these things, you often see in the water near current these beautiful swaying masses like a horse's tail swaying back and forth. That's a swaying bulrush and it's a type of sedge. And in this case, with the, there's a, some of the, uh, uh, the uh, fruiting or, or the flowering parts right here above the water. But sometimes the current will pulsate. When it does, it pulls a female right underwater while she's laying her eggs. And sometimes they both get pulled under like this, temporarily that is, until they finish the job. On the edge of the uh, uh, streams with current or small rivers with current, you'll find these beautiful large damselflies, the jewel wings. There are two species. Here is the river jewel wing, where the wing is half black and half clear, or at least lighter colored. And it's a male, brightly colored with green, iridescent green. Um, so these are pretty common. You find the, the river jewel wing often near where there's more current, while you find in areas with less current, the equally stunning ebony jewel wing. The male has solid black wings like this. The female has little white squares up in this part of the wing. They've got a wonderful mating system where the male will do these little flights over a female. And if she likes his performance, she will clap her wings, telling him it's okay to mate. If she doesn't like him, she puts her wings out flat saying no. So here's a female here, and she's actually already mated, but this guy is still persisting, hoping to, I think, for another opportunity. But she's got her abdomen down. She's laying eggs in that leaf. And there she is. These are the biggest amplifiers we have, and they are spectacular. Very common, especially on smaller streams of current. And even on rivers with, with lots of vegetation on the edges. 
There are other dragonflies too found on this habitat, the stream cruiser, for example. Now, often these damselflies are sitting on floating plants. And these plants aren't floating downstream, but their leaves are floating on top of the water and their flowers are sticking out. These are pond weeds. And there are a number of species, and some uh, are thrive in faster current, some thrive in, in slower current, even still water systems. The ones that uh, grow, grow in, in, in uh, faster flowing water with current, they're rooted to the bottom, but the stems are very flexible and the leaves are often more narrow which makes them uh, uh, less drag on the water surface. So pond weeds, and these ones, of course, you can tell by the way the leaves are pointing, which way the current is flowing on this uh, river. There aren't too many flowers growing in the water itself, but on the shoreline, there are many more. And here we see a beautiful shoreline full of Joe pie weed, the pink flower, and the stunning red cardinal flower. This flower likes areas with calcium, so we see it more commonly off the shield than on the Canadian shield. The flowers are brilliant red. Very few flowers are this color up here. And the reason for that is they are not pollinated by insects. The only known pollinator for cardinal flower is the ruby-throated hummingbird here in the east. It's got a long spur with nectar down below. It requires a long bill and a long tongue to access it. And as the bird feeds, the flower sexual parts rub on its forehead. So pollen is transported on the head of the hummingbird as it goes from flower to flower. Also, if there's a bit of calcium in the water on the shoreline, you might find purple fringed orchid. It's one of the most beautiful orchids that we have. It reminds me of little angels almost as you, as you admire it from a close range, beautiful flower. Now, with current and rivers and so on, if they slow down around bays and so on, often you get another habitat forming. And these are really important habitats we call cattail marshes. Marshes are different from swamps, where swamps have living trees growing out of the water and they're generally still water systems. Here with cattail uh, marshes, you've got water that pulsates through the system and drives the ecosystem. You get higher water in spring that floods the, uh, the habitat. And when the, water is when the water floods the marsh, uh, it becomes anaerobic in terms of bacterial activity on the uh, nutrients. When the water withdraws, or aerobic bacteria, bacteria that need oxygen, begin to work on the organic matter. And that helps recycle nutrients beautifully. A lot of matter is tied up inside the leaves and stems of cattails. They play a really important ro role in terms of purifying water and also storing things like carbon. Now there are two types of cattails. In fact, there are three types of cattails basically around here. They, there's broadleaf cattail, which are co also called common cattails. Notice how the flowers, the male parts and female parts are touching each other. Then there are narrow leaf cattails where the parts are separate. Now, narrow leaf cattails were not found in the Northeast originally, and they have been perhaps brought here or they spread here in some fashion, and they hybridize freely with the other type of cattail, and both the narrow leaved and its hybrid are almost invasive, and they will form extremely dense stands to keep out other types of plants from growing where the common cattail uh, is not quite that aggressive. So we have an awful lot of hybridization going on in that group. But regardless, cattail marshes are really vibrant habitats. And of course, one of the first birds to return in spring to the cattail marsh is a red-winged blackbird. The males arrive often a week or more before the females, set up territories, and they spend a lot of time singing and showing off their bright red epaulets like this. This one appears to be calling to himself, to himself in his reflection, perhaps getting warmed up for the real thing. But uh, females, when they finally come back, go around and choose a male, partly based perhaps on his singing quality, or perhaps on his appearance, or perhaps on the quality of the territory he holds. Because a male with a really good territory will have multiple females nesting with him. They are polygynous, which means the male has multiple mates. Now up here, you might have three or four, half a dozen females in a good territory, 
where in California, there can be 10 or 12 or more sometimes. I guess the thing's a bit looser in California than they are up here in Canada. But nonetheless, uh, running blackbirds have this unusual biology. And the male doesn't take care of feeding the baby. Babies, female does that. He just stands guard and drives away predators like crows. And red-winged blackbirds are extremely aggressive birds. They're not that big, but they are fearless. And they'll attack great blue herons, they'll attack northern harriers, they'll attack red-tailed hawks, things that, that may threaten the babies. And in fact, uh, I saw a few years ago, a red-winged blackbird attacking a great gray owl. This is the most southern nest recorded. Uh, it's not published yet. It was near Ottawa. We found the nest. Well, actually, a woman found the nest on her property of great gray owls. And, uh, and I was invited to go see them. And we saw the nest with young and went out to this pasture. And a red-winged blackbird was chasing this great gray owl and actually flew right into its wing. Now, that's aggressive, isn't it? These birds are fearless. Also in cattail marshes, you will find uh, this beautiful little vociferous wren, the marsh wren, well named for its habitat of living in marshes. They can be nasty birds too, by the way. They're known to go around and puncture aches of other birds in their territory. Like the rutting blackbird, the males are polygynous. The males have multiple mates. They arrive first in the territory, stake their claim out, and probably start building these dummy nests for females to evaluate it per. So I'll start doing these dummy nests. I'll make these structures. And when the females come back, they wander around the territories. And it may well be the number of dummy nests a male prepares may indicate a better territory where he has more time for feeding and lots of resources and more females might nest with him. The real nest has a beautiful little hole in the side and cattail down inside where the female goes in and lays her eggs and takes care of the young then. Now, also in these cattail marshes, there's a common sparrow. But this sparrow, in my opinion, is misnamed. It's called the swamp sparrow. And while they certainly may occur in some swamps, they are very common inhabitants of marshes. I think we should rename this bird this, the marsh sparrow. It's uh, such a common part, member of that habitat. And they often go down, by the way, in the aquatic plants and pick off insects to feed to their young. So you often see them walking on lily pad leaves to, uh, as they forage for food for the young. The cattails themselves create a habitat. Their roots form and, and dead components of the, of the stems and leaves form a, form a soil type. And not only do other plants uh, grow there, but some animals live there as well. And in these marshes, you have birds called rails that will walk between the cattail stalks and create a nest back on the cattail mound and raise their young there. Sora rails, this is a Sora. Soras will inhabit this habitat. They're more common, in my opinion, in sedge meadows, but they will also live in cattail marshes as this one here is showing us. The most common rail though in cattails is the Virginia rail. And these are neat birds because if you've heard the expression thin as a rail. Well, that's because these birds are compressed laterally and they can walk through very thin uh, areas, uh, narrow areas formed by those cattail stems. So thin as a rail has a real meaning. Here one's looking through some horse tails. Also, when you're off the shield, Canadian shield, down in the lower uh, limestone areas, you tend to have common gallinules. And, and these are a member of the same group as the rails are. They have extremely long toes for walking on wet vegetation, and they can also swim relatively well, but those feet are more uh, built for walking on, on floating plants. And one inhabitant of the cattail marshes we often hear but don't see quite as often, and that's this bird right down here. Here's the bill, here are the eyes. It's pointing up in the air, and here's his breast streaks. That's an American bittern. And they have a very deep, low-frequency sound that carries far and wide through a cattail marsh and beyond. When they get frightened, they point their bills in the air, allowing their body shape and vertical marks on the breast to blend in really well with the habitat around them. And they freeze, they don't move. Now people will say, wow, that's a really smart bird and knows it can't be seen. 
there's a drawback to it. When it's got a bill in the air, it's got to have the eyes facing forward. So the eyes of a bittern are placed near the base of the bill, which allows the bird to see in front of it quite nicely. But it'll freeze even in the opening. It's just a programmed behavior to uh, not move. And so if you're in a canoe as I was many years ago, I paddled by this American bittern, which froze immediately. It's on a stump. And as I paddled behind it, it couldn't see behind its head because the eye placement. So what did it do? It had to turn its neck around. And I paddled right around the stump a couple of times, and the bird almost broke its neck. No, I didn't do that, obviously. But uh, this shows how that behavior is programmed. Now, the adaptation to solve, uh, you know, not seeing in front of it as a predator might approach it uh, causes a problem seeing behind it. So for every solution in nature, there's often a drawback that has to be dealt with a different way as well. That's a baby American bittern, still has down on the head, and it shows those great feet. It has long toes also, an adaptation for walking in, in semi-aquatic habitats. If you're lucky in the southern part of the, ha of, the, uh, of the marshland areas in Ontario, you encounter least bitterns, which are a threatened species. They certainly have declined. That may be in part to marshes being drained and habitats changing through time. Um, in cattail marshes, there are predatory animals, of course. Northern water snakes are there. They'll feed on fish, but also on frogs and young birds and things like that. Whenever you see a northern water snake and you see the eye turning cloudy, or for any snake for that matter, that means that snake is about to shed its skin. And uh, there's a liquid then behind the scale on the eye and the new scale that developed over the eye. Of course, there's a great diversity of dragonflies in this habitat. These are often the larger bodied skimmers. That's a 12 spot skimmer here. Of course, there are large numbers of waterfowl that nest in marshes, like this wood duck. But this habitat, the marsh habitat, has so many um, similarities and shared organisms with the next habitat, the beaver habitat, a beaver pond habitat. I'm going to lump it, the two together because beaver ponds are also a habitat that supports almost everything a cattail marsh does. Even cattails can come in if the pond is in a rich area for nutrients. Of course, the big difference is marshes form naturally without any aid of animals, while in terms of beaver ponds, of course, they are formed by an animal, the beaver. And I could not finish up without talking about beavers in depth because they create a, a dam to create a pond in many cases. They create the pond for themselves, they want water to, uh, that doesn't freeze to the bottom in winter. They want water that gives them large access to, to uh, resources on shore. That's still keeping them close to the safety of the water. And uh, so they're doing it for selfish reasons. They build a pond for their own benefit. But in doing so, they create a habitat that supports so many other living organisms from small to large. Uh, now, I didn't talk about turtles in the cattail marsh because they're also found in beaver ponds. So we have the commonality of having turtles involved. And here's a hood of merganser female on the log as well. Painted turtles and other turtles will bask in the sun on logs and rocks because it warms up their body. They're ectothermic animals. But also, it helps drive ectoparasites off their skin, things like leeches. They leave the water primarily to lay their eggs. And you can see on this painted turtle, a nice leech in here, uh, hoping the turtle goes back in the water soon. They dig a female, dig a hole and drop their eggs into it. Depending on the age of the turtle and type of turtle, the number of eggs does vary. Painted turtles will lay fewer eggs, maybe a dozen or more, uh, compared to the snapping turtle, they can lay 40 or more eggs. Once the eggs are laid, they're covered up with the soil and left to hatch on their own. Not many eggs make it, though, because predators like red foxes, also skunks and raccoons, love turtle eggs. And, uh, and so this fox here, I saw it at daybreak. It was looking for turtle eggs. And it went around sniffing the edge of a road by streams and finally went to one spot and began to dig furiously. And you can see the saw here flying up behind its legs. 
So it dug and dug and dug. Within a few minutes, it came up with eggs. And it sliced the eggs with its great canine teeth and licked out the contents. So they don't swallow the eggs whole. They don't chew them up. They slice them and lick out the contents. And that's why if you find a nest has been depredated, uh, you'll see the eggshells looking fairly intact, slid open, and the contents licked out of them. All our turtles have this behavior, and the soil temperature helps determine the sex of eggs that hatch. It's unusual because in most animals, after the egg is fertilized by sperm, the sex of the animal is determined. But in turtles, not so much. And the soil temperature, if it's really warm, above a certain threshold, can produce all females. Too cold, also mostly females, and in between will be a mixture of males and females. So it's possible, if you think about it, with climate change, if we get continuing increases in summer temperatures and the soil temperatures keep on increasing to, to crazy levels, it is possible that all female turtles would be hatched only, and that would mean through time the end of turtles as we know them. By the way, blandings, a species at risk, which is not that rare actually in our area down around uh, uh, the Salmon River watershed, um, they can withdraw inside their shell and they can partly close up the bottom part of the shell, a thing that most turtles can't do. Most turtles have their shells fixed, the carapace and plastron, but they have a little hinge on the bottom and they can partly close that up like a drawbridge. Snapping turtles are also very common inhabitants of cattail marshes and beaver ponds, but they are not as commonly seen until they're laying eggs because they, while they do bask sometimes, they don't bask as frequently as painted turtles do and blandings do, and so we see them much less often out of the water like this. There are certain mammals that thrive in both cattail marshes and in beaver ponds, and they include muskrats. Muskrats are primarily vegetarian. However, they do have a taste for clams, and often you'll find piles of clam shells in the bottom of a waterway where muskrats have been devouring them. They nip off the mussels and open them up and devour the insides. But they eat a lot of plant material. And in fact, they build their, their, their lodges out of plant and not out of woody material. So softer material like cattails and so on will be used in the construction of their lodge where the young are born. And by the way, muskrats seem to be pretty gentle little animals, but they are known to, the females are known to go next door to a neighbor's uh, a lodge and slaughter all her babies. Um, it's a strange behavior, but it may help in, in, in controlling populations when they get too dense. Not too many animals do this. Lions are known, of course, to slaughter young of a pride they take over, but female muskrats will also do that in times of high uh, density pressures. By the way, you see when standing up, especially in cold conditions, it's amazing how pink their toenails seem to be because their toes are pink. There's less blood flowing down to them. But like beavers, they are not animals that hibernate and they're active all through the winter. Muskrats have one main predator, in daytime at least. At night, great horned owls do like uh, muskrats. And uh, it's been thought that the owls have declined in Ontario perhaps in part because muskrat populations have declined. But in daytime, uh, one of their main predators is the mink. Mink are shoreline hunters, and they are common around beaver ponds and even marsh edges, and they work their shoreline. They'll eat frogs and small fish, but they also love muskrat. I noticed too that you often see in the fall um, uh, mink on top of uh, food piles that beavers have created. Uh, these are piles of branches near the lodge that the beavers eat uh, from underwater, under the ice during the winter. They bring a piece into their lodge and devour it there. But in the fall, they create these huge piles of branches. And of course, small fish like shelter. And I think mink benefit from beaver lodges and beaver uh, food piles because they go down in the water amongst the branches to get small fish very commonly. Yeah, last summer we came across a female mink and her babies, and it was quite a sight. The noises they were making the young ones was a kind of a churring sound that was continuous as they moved around. They actually had four young, but one went off by itself, a bit adventuresome, and probably caught up later on to them. Cute little things, aren't they? 
little mink. They don't have web toes fully. They have a little bit of webbing, but mostly dense hair on their feet that allows them to swim. When they swim, they're not, they're good swimmers, but not strong swimmers. Uh, they have, uh, they do more of a dog paddle as you move across the water surface. But beavers are also no speeder, are also not speedsters, but they certainly swim really well and they can dive well. And I couldn't leave the beaver pond without talking a bit about a pretty important animal. Uh, beavers are phenomenal, not just for creating a habitat, but they're, they're adaptations for their, their lifestyle. For example, they have the nose, their eyes, and their ears in a line on top of the head, which very few animals have. It allows them to flow to the water surface with all their senses quite a, quite working quite well while they're pretty well hidden. And uh, crocodiles have that, be, uh, that feature, as do hippopotami but not a lot of animals do. And of course, they have a phenomenal thing called the tail that's modified so much. First is very scaly, and that allowed in France in the 1700s beavers to be classified as a fish, and therefore Catholics could eat them on Fridays. When we see a beaver's tail, though, we only see two thirds of it. The basal third is all muscle and heavily haired, and it drives a tail. The tail to me is a Swiss army knife of animal tails. It is so multifunctional. For example, at the water surface it can be a counterbalance. It's a rudder when swimming. It's a prop on land. It's like a third leg forming a, like a tripod when they're felling trees or if they're grooming themselves, when they groom the tails in front of the body to expose the lower part of the belly for the grooming process. The tail is an air conditioner in summer and a heat retainer in winter. Um, what they do is they've got at the base of the tail where it's heavily furred, a counter current heat exchanger with arteries and veins branching around each other. In summer, they, they bypass that wonderful net as it's called and put more blood through the tail to lose body heat to the water around them. In winter, they, sh they put the, the blood through that network and therefore, the blood going back to the heart is warmed. The, the cold uh, blood leaving here is warmed by the arterial temperatures. And the blood coming out here is cooled down then. So winter or beaver's tail is only a few degrees above freezing. And that means if the water is four degrees, it's actually not losing energy to the water around it. Pretty amazing system. And also the tail, of course, is used for communication. The beaver tail slap is famous. And actually here you can see all that muscle. This is part of the tail driving the scaled part downward. And that creates a wonderful splashing and a huge sound like a cannon going off, crack, that can startle a predator, allowing the beaver to escape and also warn other members of the colony that hear this, that danger may be afoot. And just like snowflakes, by the way, no two beaver tail slaps are the same. This is beaver art. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. And a little more about beavers. To me, these are the, you know, the, the crown jewels of the animal world because of the habitat they make. But just think about their importance in terms of our country. By the way, the very first animal on a poster stamp in the entire world was our beaver in 1851, the beaver stamp. It's on our coin. And I'm very worried about this because we've lost the penny. What comes next if we lose more coins? The beaver's going to be gone. Surely our national animal since 1975 will always be held in our pockets. Um, it's been used by advertisers for building supplies, roots, of course. The Hudson Bay Company that made us fortune off of trapping beavers has no fewer than four beavers on his emblem, the Hudson's Bay Company. And even Parks Canada has beavers as, his, as a symbol. Now think about this, look carefully at these beavers. Have you ever noticed they all face left? They're left leaning animals. Why is that? I've searched high and low for beaver facing right. I finally found one, the thirsty beaver in, in BC. So is it because he's half snapped? Is that why he's looking the other direction? 
Don't know why, but uh, he is looking in the right direction. But beavers, of course, don't drink. And they're very good Canadians, by the way, because during COVID, were you aware of this, that beavers wore masks? How about that? Pretty amazing. That's not a mask, by the way. It's some foam in the water is cleaning off. Anyway, beavers create this fantastic habitat full of so much life because beaver ponds retain nutrients. Uh, water coming in in the stream, the former stream, drops off nutrients down below. Uh, the flooded land brings in nutrients. Beavers bring in trees and so on where their organic matter has nutrients. They become this great source of nutrients. And the muck down below is quite rich, which allows a lot of plants to thrive. By the shores, you'll find wild iris. They're pollinated by bumblebees that force their way in and do the pollination job under this petal. You have plants that have floating leaves and flowers like white water lily, which by the way is a complex flower. The first day it opens, it's, it's an active female flower with down to the base, a stigmatic fluid that attracts bees and flies and beetles. And they wander down and if they have pollen on them, it gets left off in that fluid. The flower will close overnight. On day two, it opens up as a male flower with the stamens active now, releasing pollen and no more stigmatic fluid down below. So any flies walking around or beetles walking around will pick up pollen from this and carry it to another flower that's got the stigmatic fluid available to it. The yellow pond lily, the bullhead lily, does the same sort of thing too. Very complex flowers. By the way, bees love eating both these species. They eat the leaves, the flowers, the stems, and the underwater rhizomes. And in doing so, by the way, they can break off rhizome chunks that float away and sink down and start a new plant up, almost like farmers planting their crops. One of the smallest little flowers in a, in a beaver pond is water shield, Brazenia. And it's got leaves that are small and oval shaped and the stem down below in the middle, like a little shield. And the flowers are quite beautiful. And you don't see flowers that often though, but you often see a very dense carpet of their leaves. And by the way, here's a mink frog hiding amongst those leaves. They're food for a lot of animals. Uh, this is a water lily leaf beetle. Both the adult and the larvae will eat the leaf. And you, it's very hard to find by late summer uh, water shield leaves that haven't got patterns true to them. And by the way, quite often these patterns are quite creative. Uh, this next one really caught my eye. I could see a kid's fairy tale in here. Can you see Cinderella? See her happy eyes, her little smile, her little slipper, her little foot? You know, the more and more you look at nature, the more you start seeing things in it that aren't supposed to be there. At least no one's recorded them. But, uh, or maybe I'm spending too much time looking at nature, maybe. However, by the way, these water shield leaves are a really important food for moose. And, uh, and in fact, moose get most of their sodium, their yearly supply of sodium from water plants like water shield. And that's why moose go to summer, uh, go to ponds in summer lake edges to feast on the water plants. It's not to escape biting flies, which, of which there are many on moose, it's to get the sodium fix. And they store that sodium in the first part of their stomach, the rumen, and then distribute it through the rest of the year then. And as moose go under the water and come up, these huge hordes of flies leave their bodies. These are moose flies. They're like a small house fly, and both males and females do feed on blood and skin debris. And they climb under the moose's hide. But then when the moose goes under the water, up they fly, and they land again when the moose settles back down. They don't really seem to bother the moose. Their whole life cycle is tied to moose. And in fact, the females lay their eggs in moose droppings. So lots of uh, 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 things benefiting from those beaver ponds and the water plants in them. Of course, the waters are rich with insect life, both on top and down below the water surface. Water striders, right on that water tension. These are predatory insects that can move really quickly as can these beetles, the whirly gigs. And you know, it's amazing to watch these beetles because they're often found in large numbers. And uh, they, they float around the eyes to see both below and above the water at one time. And they can spin around and never hit each other. You know, you wonder how thousands can do this. So here's a pond where there's a huge number of whirly gigs. They're on top of the water. They're not flying in the air. This is a cloudy day with reflections of the clouds. And uh, you can see this mass here is swirling. 
and these ones haven't moved yet. But eventually, as I watched more and more and more swarmed until the entire thing was this living mass of uh, movement, it was fantastic. Uh, by the way, many of the aquatic insects on top of the water are dark above and pale below. And that makes them camouflage from two different uh, uh, viewpoints. Looking down, if you're, say, a bird, you'll see dark on dark. If you're below as a fish looking up, you see light on light. So they're bicolored for camouflage from two directions. But there's one exception. This fellow here is a black belly and a white back, quite the opposite. Why is that? It's a back swimmer. It swims upside down on the water surface. So the same principle of bicolored, but uh, uh, well hidden from two perspectives. As lakes have insects in the bottom, mud, uh, often midge larvae, uh, so do beaver ponds. And you often see swarms of midges in the evening. These are males uh, looking for females which fly into the swarm and somehow, no one knows how the selection process is done, but a male will find a female and mate with her. These midges are really important foods for a number of insects, predatory flies, for example. And as they rest on leaves along the water's edge in daytime, they're food for migrating birds. And especially along some of the bigger bodies of water, uh, midges form a very important diet for these songbirds that stop over for a couple of days to refuel on their way back up north again. Of course, there are many old nates in there. I mentioned that um, cattail marshes have this pretty well the same group uh, quite often. We have a lot of damselflies, the bluets, including the marsh bluet. Eastern forktails, the males are spectacular little jewels. Uh, sedge sprites are quite common as well. So these little predatory insects are often down on the edge of those ponds. Here's a pair of sedge sprites. Here's the male still attached to the female. She's inserting her egg into a slit in this uh, stem, underwater stem. The skimmers are a very common group in beaver ponds and in marshes too. If the water is fairly still, uh, you have these big body dragonflies there, which means that their nymphs in the water are big bodied too, because dragonflies and damselflies have most of their life spent as a nymph inside the water. Here's a few of the skimmers you find. That's, I'm sorry, a male common whitetail. Females look quite a bit different. They look more like the 12 spotted skimmer, which are pretty common too. The four spotted skimmers are one of the most common uh, uh, dragonflies around this habitat. As are the chalk fronted skimmers, also called chalk fronted corporals, which can be abundant as well. So lots of these dragonflies. And if you're lucky, you'll find another kind of dragonfly called the club tail on the lily pads. This one is a lily pad club tail. And it has this habit of resting on top of the uh, uh, lily pad leaves before it goes off and catches something to come back and eat with. And eat, sorry. That's the male here. Now, I mentioned that these, these dragonflies and damselflies form what's called the wheel. I like to call it the heart. Here's the male. This is a Halloween pennant uh, on a cattail stem here, a leaf. And here's the claspers behind the female's head. And there she is getting her his contribution to the offspring. In some species, the females insert the eggs by themselves under the water into plant tissues. Here's a common green darner. But in other cases, the males stay coupled with them. Here's the real magic, though, to a dragonfly life. Uh, for a year, this dragonfly spent its life underwater, breathing through gills in its back end with breathing tubes all through its body. After a year, when the water temperature is just right, it climbed out as a gill-breathing nymph, secured itself onto a stem here, a cattail leaf, and then the back split open. As the dragonfly forced its way out, here are the breathing tubes now breaking off like umbilical cords on a baby. And it's changing from a gill breathing uh, nymph in the water to a fully air breathing flying master of the air. When the wings first come out, they have to be, uh, uh, their, their so-called blood is pumped through the veins to harden the wings. They force, force the wings open. But in that stage, they're very easily captured by blackbirds 
both green blackbirds and grackles feast on these things all day long. And of course, they bring back many, many of these to feed their babies. So they time their nesting at a time that the dragonflies are really coming out in numbers and they are very good at finding them. I'll tell you a very quick story here about this photograph. I tried for days to get a good picture of a blackbird getting a dragonfly nymph right here. And I showed this photograph, I spoke at an uh, entomological conference a couple of years ago, and the top entomologists in Ontario were at this conference. And I was giving this talk on Algonquin Park, and I was very proudly showing off a few of the dragonflies and this picture here. When somebody yelled out from the back, uh, Michael, that's not a dragonfly, I said, that's a mayfly. And I said, no, no. And then somebody else called out the same thing. And Steve Marshall, the guru of entomology in Canada, perhaps North America, not only called out that it was a, a mayfly, but named the species. I was devastated. My mistakes are like unforgivable if you're a naturalist. But I, I thought I couldn't be wrong. So that night I couldn't sleep and I got my computer out and I brought up this picture and enlarged it. And I thought, aha, they were fooled. They thought this were mayfly tails coming down. What they saw was a, a, a sedge leaf superimposed uh, under the uh, dragonfly. Here's a nymph case right here. So the next morning I showed this to the, to the entomologist and they said we were wrong. So there we go. Here's a case where I felt like <laughs> ready to die. I was so embarrassed, but, the uh, but I was vilified. And, and you know, here I am, uh, uh, I was right that it was a dragonfly. Thank goodness. I haven't quite lost it yet. Anyway, dragonflies have other things too that they pick up. These are beautiful little water mites, they're nurse, that uh, live in the water, but they attach to a dragonfly nymph. When the nymph comes out, they attach to the flying dragonfly for a while and feed on its blood, and then eventually drop off in the water again. Pretty remarkable animals, these, uh, these mites. Of course, the aquatic insects and flying insects are food for other animals, and the flying insects are caught by frogs. And these habitats support things like green frogs uh, with their tadpoles, water bullfrogs, and tadpoles take two years to mature into a frog. Uh, biting insects also go to, to frogs, by the way. Here's a biting midge getting blood. Um, some frogs are found in the, in the beaver pond year round, but other frogs like leopard frogs come and lay their eggs but often leave them become more terrestrial through the summer months. And some like American toads only come to the water to breed, to lay their eggs and then uh, depart and go back and live on land then for the rest of the year. By the way, when the males sing, uh, whether it's a frog or a toad, the females listen and they come into the, and they choose the male by his song, by quality of his song. And the male jumps on and, puts his arms around her belly, gives her a squeeze called implexus. And whether a female allows that male to fertilize her eggs, in part depends on how well he holds her. And northern water snakes, of course, are in the marshes and they're also in beaver ponds and they are there to, to eat whatever they can capture. Another snake we have down though in the southern part of, of some watersheds is the ribbon snake. It's not really found commonly on the shield, but off the shield it can be, and it loves beaver ponds. It's like a garter snake, but the cheek is really, really white. There are other features too, where the lines and occur and so on. It's often a very slender snake and brightly colored, but that white cheek is a really good mark to separate from a garter snake. And of course, there's larger predators too in these ponds. Uh, great blue herons are stalking frogs and, and tadpoles and everything else they can get their, their bills on or around. And they'll go for large fish, and they will spear large fish. This is a bullhead, a uh, type of catfish, and this heron has obviously impaled it with its bill. And uh, it struggled for a while, shook it off, and it would stab it a number of times trying to kill it. Because, of course, these have great spines as a defense on the side of the head that make them hard to swallow. Otters, frequent beaver ponds, they are not a predator of beavers. That's a myth. And here you can see it's got a tadpole. They eat a lot of tadpoles through the year, but they also eat fish, and including this bullhead right here being enjoyed in winter, but they don't eat beavers. However, they will eat turtles, and they're known to go to snapping turtles lying in the bottom that are dormant and bite off their heads and legs. 
Um, but uh, they also, well, they were not really known to go for little pain to turtles, but I saw uh, an otter crunching on something one late winter on top of the ice. Next morning, I went out to retrieve it, and there were two little tiny painted turtles, only a couple of years old at the best, that were being eaten by the otter. Because as a large turtle, the shell cannot be penetrated by the otter's teeth, but very small uh, painted turtles, obviously it can be. And thinking I might do a beaver book someday, I put a scent beside it, or sorry, a scent, a nickel with the beaver showing for a scale. Anyways, otters are fantastic animals. They are freshwater seals, basically. And you often see this time of year, the youngsters together still traveling around and feeding in good spots where there's lots of tadpoles or small fish. And they're comical to watch. You know, they, they do a lot of playing. They often share secrets, it seems, sometimes quite shocking ones, apparently. <laughs> Obviously not. Anyways, they're great. If you want to see an otter up close, by the way, if you see one in a pond or in a beaver pond or in a river, just snort at it. They have an alarm call. <laughs> you do that, they get very curious. They'll swim up and they'll often rise out of the water to see what's going on to find out where this otter impersonator is. The ponds, of course, are nurseries for waterfowl. And the two ducks, especially that are common in beaver ponds, are wood ducks. Females left alone to raise their young. And hooded mergansers, same thing. And the reason they're often found in beaver ponds is that they nest in dead trees and cavities in dead trees. And beaver ponds usually have dead trees standing in the water or on the shore at least. And these provide nest sites for these ducks, both wood ducks and hooded mergansers are cavity adopters. And so they're great. Uh, uh, beaver ponds are great for these birds because they not only offer food in terms of aquatic insects and small fish for the hood and mergansers, but a lot of organic material for the wood ducks. So our waterways, they're so varied. And any watershed consists of not just one type. Uh, and they're all very important habitats in their own right. So ranging from beaver ponds to, to northern peatlands, to lake edges, river edges, and so on. These habitats support a huge diversity of living organisms of flora and fauna, from very large to medium size to, of course, very small if you're, if you're a, uh, an invertebrate. They're all vitally important, not only for providing habitat for living organisms, but also for the quality of water that we depend upon. And it's so important to preserve every part of a watershed and not just the water, but the land around because all these organisms and ourselves depend on its quality. So another feature too about, about waterways and wetlands and, and things like that is that they're more than just a place to see plants and animals. They're also a place that gives us not only great solace, but also inspiration and really lifts our souls to a new dimension. We go to a cattail marsh and see the wind massaging the cattails. Or just reflections of clouds and trees on a lake are paddling over. These are living museums, living art galleries. And they are essential parts of our life. So thank you for coming this evening and watching the presentation and supporting the Friends of the Salmon River and other affiliated groups. Um, it is so essential today to have groups like these that, that help us preserve what we need to have for not only for ourselves, for the present, but for our children for the future. Thanks very much. All right, I would love to just, on behalf of everybody, give you a huge round of applause. Thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation. It's amazing. The stories you can tell with just photos, and the photos are obviously beautiful uh, and very inspirational and calming and um, overall fantastic presentation, and we're so grateful to have you here. So thank you very much again. Um, I think we'll see a lot of enthusiasts along the Salmon River making some otter impersonations <laughs> and I'm sure lots of people will be like, what are they doing? And uh, 
yeah, hopefully we'll we'll get some otter more otters coming to the shore from that. Good. And the the beaver art was was very fun and and humorous and and great. So thanks very much for that. Um, and from here, I will pass it along to Stephen Moore, who is going to be going through some of the questions that we got in the chat uh, and moderating that. So if you do have any other dish, additional questions for Michael, please post them in the chat and uh, Stephen can go through them now. Thanks. Okay, that's excellent. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Um, uh, Michael, uh, I'm particularly knocked out by the uh, photographs. Uh, so, I mean, do you have any tips for nature photographers other than you have to spend 100 years in the uh, woods uh, quietly? Well, my, my, my sole amount of uh, advice would be to learn about nature first. Um, to go off the camera and just blindly stumble the nature can be one way of doing it certainly but your experience is so enhanced if you know more about the organisms so study first if you're going to a, a pond where there's dragonflies see what dragonflies could be there and, and then you also read about their behavior with the with the jewel wings and their courtship and things like that i had a huge advantage i think and being a naturalist first. And I have been a naturalist all my life since I was five years old when I began bird watching. And so I spent most of my time in nature and, uh, and got to know nature and then wanted to learn about it all the time. I still, I, the, you know, as you learn more, you realize how little you know. And I feel so stupid most of the time because, you know, <laughs> I want to know everything. And, and at my age, I'm forgetting things I knew previously. So I'm on a downward trend, I think, in terms of knowledge of nature. But that to me is a big, a big uh, uh, plus is to know about nature. And if you want to, for example, photograph really elusive things like wolves, uh, then you have to know a lot about them in order to try to, you know, to get in the position. And, and it's so important to, to not disturb whatever you're trying to photograph. You have to respect it. And, and that's foremost. And I've often not taken photographs because I felt I was intruding on the animal and perhaps causing it some discomfort. And so what's more important is to, uh, I think, to enjoy the animal or the plant or whatever, and, and make sure you leave it untouched, un, un you know, uh, not bothered by your presence. And, and that's a key where a lot of people who do take photographs care more about that prized image than about the organism and people who bait animals and, you know, tear apart the habitats to photograph a plant and things like that. That's not the way to do it. Mm. Um, as in my photographs, I, I'm a very basic photographer. Uh, I have these very expensive cameras and lenses. Everything is shot on manual. Uh, I have these bodies with a hundred or more functions. I, I have no idea what they do. I put them on manual and I just learned on film to shoot with using the proper lighting and backgrounds. That's a key thing, learning how to, to see what's actually in the photograph. You want to do your subject justice. You want to get in the best possible, you know, lighting and best possible environment around it. And often the best photographs are not ones that are the animals full frame. It's often when there's more of the environment in, in it, I find anyway. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't call myself a photographer. And, and, and that term nature photographer is one that I don't like usually to be given because I've seen so many people that are called nature photographers who don't have the knowledge or the respect for the animals and plants that they should have. Right. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Good tips. Uh, someone uh, mentioned climate change. I mean, we're in the middle of climate yes. change and we have more to come. Um, what are the mechanisms of the impact of increasing temperature? We think of, you know, more or less water and you mentioned maybe the gender of turtles, but are there are there other mechanisms of... Uh, so the, yeah, there, there certainly are, you know, with, with water temperatures changing, that's allowing organisms that were farther south to live farther north. So you have a change in species composition. Sometimes that's fine, but sometimes non-native species take advantage. And, uh, and we're certainly seeing that in our waterways with things like zebra mussels and quagga mussels. Um, but uh, also, too, water temperatures changing uh, does affect when insects emerge as adults. And it's been shown in some bird species that they're out of sync in terms of 
when they're nesting with their food supply for their young and that they're programmed to arrive at a certain time on the nesting grounds because of the photo period uh, that's been tried and true for thousands of years, then all of a sudden water temperatures are increasing really quite rapidly, much more so than would in a natural, uh, by, 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 uh, caused by natural causes. And therefore the insects are responding by emerging earlier. And now they, they've tied declines in some birds that feed on flying insects to the uh, change in flight season for the, for the flying insects they feed upon. So yes, mm -hmm. definitely climate change has all kinds of insidious effects. And, and you know, we, we don't even know all the effects that are going to happen until they actually happen. And by then it may be too late to do any corrective. Well, it's pretty well almost too late now to do any corrective. When you look at yeah. what you know, the, the, last, the, the climate change conference they had and, and the reluctance to act quickly is just frightening. You know? Yes. Uh, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Um, when, when beavers, a uh, beaver dam breaks or the beavers move on and the water dries yeah. up, then you have a beaver meadow, I understand. Yes. Is that a particular ecology as well? Oh, they is look it, so nice. It, is it ever? I love beaver meadows. And the thing is about uh, this, it's a recycling of, of, of the nutrients because when the dam breaks, perhaps because the beavers were killed or uh, something else has transpired or the food supply is pretty well gone, so they moved on. When the dam breaks, think about that organic muck on the bottom of the pond, you know, a decade or more of buildup. And when that's exposed to the air, there's sedges right away that start colonizing it and other plants start colonizing it. And through time, as a succession, it can become, you know, a, a forest due to pioneer species like trembling aspen. And then beavers may come back again and damn it. You know, in my time, which is not that long with this planet, I've seen one pond go through, it's into the third cycle now, going from oh. pond to meadow back to pond again, because beavers can return and damn it again. And, you know, there's a, if there's a year of high water, a lot of rainfall, the streams flow more strongly through the habitat and they damn it again. And, and so it's fantastic. But the meadow itself, you know, it, it becomes a wildflower meadow. And that becomes so good for many of the butterflies. Uh, a lot of our tiny skippers feed on sedges as larvae, as, as caterpillars. And therefore, these meadows are fantastic spots for, for the skippers. And then there's a variety of grasshoppers and their relatives that feed on the plants. And, and these beaver meadows play a really important role in wolves, coyotes, and moose. And the reason is uh, both coyotes and, and, and eastern wolves, the ones that are found in western Quebec and through Algonquin Park, uh, will bring their pups in late summer to these meadows as rendezvous sites, which means the pups are left there. The adults go off and hunt and bring food back to them internally. And, and so they play really important roles in the raising of pups for wolves. And beaver is also an important food for eastern wolves, too. So there's that benefit as well. But in terms of uh, moose, then, moose, female moose in the east in our area uh, uh, go to a spot like a beaver meadow and they call for the bulls to come in. So they are the ones that attract the bulls. And out west and northwest is the bulls attract the cows, quite different. But here it's different. And, uh, and beaver meadows are preferred calling arena for cows. So beavers indirectly have enhanced the sex lives of moose around here by, cre <laughs> by creating these meadows. It's a neat uh, thing. So yes, the meadows are really important habitats and they will change through time to succession and become a forest again and, and quite possibly go back to a beaver pond. I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if you did a core through a well-established beaver pond going back, you know, thousands of years, you would see a whole series of ponds upon a pond uh, in that habitat. Hmm, right. Now, someone from Prince Edward County said that at Lake on the Mountain, um, the beavers are being harassed. Someone is destroying their lodge, pulling their food piles from the water, burning them. Is this legal? And if not, who manages? That, that's, that's the problem. Yeah. And it, sh it should be illegal. Uh, but I'm, I see it commonly in Algonquin Park, for example, where loggers break the dams in the fall because they don't want the roads flooded. And there are ways around this. You know, they, there's beaver baffles you put in, so they, that's a poor excuse. And in the fall is the worst time possible because beavers have a food pile developed for the winter. If you destroy a dam in the fall, they lose that habitat. 
their their water for the winter and 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 they'll they'll die almost assuredly they will die but all the other organisms in that pond as well now you're in a lake you know lake on the on the mountain as you said it's a little different but uh still it'll change the water level and that will affect organisms um if it's on private land uh landowners seem to have a lot of leeway with what they can do with beavers they can say their problems and therefore they can deal with them themselves there's not a lot of protection for our national animal, and it's a it's a sad thing indeed. So mm. uh, I would suspect that someone should uh, see where the lodge and you know, is, is 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 on someone's property or next to someone's property, and and uh, if not, then they are definitely breaking the law by doing that, taking it mm -hmm. in their own hand. Okay. Oh, thank you. One, the last question. Um, our new grandson has a bunch of bird books where you know you open the book, you press a button, and you hear the bird sound. I saw one of those. They're fantastic. Oh, they are fantastic. Actually, I'm going to give one to a friend of mine who's an adult who's just getting into birding. <laughs> but, well, sure. Uh, yeah. I have lots of kids' books I use for reference. Oh, absolutely. Have Have you ever seen a book that has the same thing but with frog calls? I've seen books that have, and for grasshoppers too, that have in the back a, a little uh, 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 CD for playing the songs. I haven't seen one for, you know, the book itself, but if not, that's a brilliant idea. You should copyright that. <laughs> <laughs> Make a fortune. But okay. I saw that, that bird one recently. We had a couple of people out for a private tour, and uh, the, the, the boy was, I think he was seven years old and really keen on birds, and he was so proud of his bird book. And it was one where he pushed the button, and, the, and I was really impressed by that. Oh, no kidding. It's a great way to start, eh? When I was a kid, when I started, I was five years old. I learned all the bird songs by tracking down the bird and identifying right. it. And, and well, that's probably the best way, but you have to spend a lot of time doing that. Of course, people starting off later in life, especially, don't have a lot of time for doing that. So you want to take the best means. But I was lucky as I learned the hard way. But that made every bird song or call note stay with me. And uh, and luckily, they they. Most of them are still there upon recall. Well, that's good. I haven't lost that's that. That's good. Yet, so. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Michael. I mean, this was just top notch. There, I'll uh, copy the chat and send it to you because there's all kinds of thank yous. Your former students are, uh, you know, some of your students that uh, uh, are saying, oh, this reminded me of class and it was so nice. And uh, <laughs> well, I, I'm so, glad they said that part. <laughs> it, was a, it was a nice memory, not a bad one. For oh, me. no, they just said they loved it. They loved it. So anyway, thank you very much. Well, my pleasure. And again, I hope people that are not part of the Friends will help support your, your work because you guys are fantastic. And we need more of you out there. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Michael. So I guess we can leave now. Okay. Well, thanks very much again. That was just a lot of fun, the presentation and all the questions as well. I think everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. We do have some uh, of our AGM left. Michael, if you can just unshare your screen. I Thank will you. do that. Thank you very much. Okay, I see. have. There we are. There we go. Good night, and all. Good night, Michael. It's great to have you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, bye-bye. For sure. Um, so I actually have a clip to show you of the Salmon River video which has been uh, produced by Friends of the Salmon River, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see it sometime soon. Anyway, here is 30 seconds of an ultralight flying over the Salmon River. Um, you can tell it's in the south. And the uh, pilot told us he always flew, flew toward the end of the day, like sort of 5 o'clock when the wind currents are light. And he's not... Oh, didn't I? Oh, crap. Let me go back. Pardon me. I thought I was already sharing my screen. There we go. Here's your monitor right here. So this is now 30 seconds of the um, pilot of the ultralight flying over the uh, lower half of the Salmon River on a gorgeous fall day at probably about 5 o'clock at night when the winds are not too strong. And you can have a good flight. And there you can see him turning a little bit. And there we go. Well, I just wanted to get give you an idea of 
what that looks like. And uh, there we go. The um, yeah, so we did mention it at our last AGM last year, and the Salmon River Skyview video has in fact been produced now, right from the top to the bottom of the river, an uninterrupted view of the entire river, which otherwise in many places is, of course, as you know, um, hard to see. Um, now all, to be, all that's to be added is music. And we're also getting someone to do voiceovers of people and their experiences in the river and the watershed. Uh, so we hope to start that soon and then at some point actually bring the um, Salmon River video to a theater so people can see it in, uh, on a large screen, of course. So next, we, uh, the next part of our presentation is going to be a little bit by our, I think actually, Dave, we've already sort of covered the membership, so um, if Dave Johnson can get right to the treasurer's report, um, that won't take too long. And then I just have a couple more things to mention after that. Dave, can you yes, unmute yourself? Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? You can. Okay. Um, so if you could please uh, go to the, uh, the next couple pages, and I'll just kind of direct you on um, um, you know, to uh, scroll forward or back or whatever. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so our uh, our fiscal year, I treat our fiscal year as being um, the 12 months between um, our annual general meetings. So this report is all of our 2021 or 2020, 2021 fiscal year from November uh, 2020 through November 2021. And um, as we all aware, the, uh, this year was uh, very challenging um, due to COVID and restrictions there. So <clears throat> there isn't really a lot to, uh, to cover here, particularly with respect to um, expenditures related to project work. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, if we go to the second page, um, Susan, I'd appreciate that. At the bottom here, what we can see is um, just a summary of, of our expenditures and revenue that was, uh, you know, throughout the, throughout the year. Now, um, in, in, with respect to uh expenditures uh we were just under a thousand dollars there throughout uh the, this fiscal year and the the vast majority of that um if you could please go back to uh page one susan is related to our directors and um and board members um insurance and this is related to um liability insurance basically so um, I'm sorry to say that, <clears throat> you know, this sort of thing is necessary, but as, as anyone who's, um, I guess, been associated with, a, with an association or a, or a um, volunteer organization, um, you know, if, if there was some sort of liability issue that came up, um, though if we didn't have insurance, those individual members uh, own personal wealth would be at, uh, at risk. So for uh, a tidy sum of just under $800 per annum, uh, we purchase a liability um, uh, insurance uh, against that kind of uh, potential risk. So uh, sorry to say that that is a reality, but uh, that is in fact the case. So if we go to page two again, please. <clears throat> now, um, uh, with respect to uh, with respect to revenues, uh, got to say that this year was really good with uh, respect to memberships that we were able to uh, generate just about twelve hundred dollars, a little over twelve hundred dollars in revenue this uh, this year. And I, I think uh, I've been a, the uh, <clears throat> excuse me the uh, treasurer for a few years now since about twenty fourteen. And I think this is one of our best years for, uh, for memberships. And that is largely, I think, a function of the fact that uh, people can now 
and have for a couple of years now been able to purchase memberships through our website rather than through word of mouth and you know necessarily necessarily getting together at physical uh, whether it be AGMs or or, uh, or uh, events that we're putting on so um, I would encourage anyone who is uh, interested in um, in purchasing a membership to it's very easy to do to go to uh, our website and to uh, purchase a membership uh, using your your credit card or PayPal um, function if you if you have that it's uh, it's quite easy to do and you know we'd love to uh, to have you as a member and and uh, when we you know we pull or I guess I go into our PayPal account uh, about every two three months maybe every quarter and uh, and um, pull that information and, and the uh, and deposit the money into our bank account but at that time uh, I will get the information about who those members are and uh, someone will send you an email and thank you for um, for contributing and for becoming a member with uh, with the Friends of the Salmon River. So if we can go back to that second page again, Susan. All this to say that uh, over the past year, um, we've had uh, expenditures, um, as I mentioned, just about uh, uh, just under a thousand dollars, and uh, in, uh, between memberships and uh, generous donations from those who have been purchasing memberships or those who just wish to uh, donate to the Friends of the Salmon River, we're uh, excuse me, sorry, um, we're we're just about over thirteen hundred. Hey, Herb, Herb, I think you're uh, have unmuted yourself. Okay, uh, so um, uh, I guess uh, happy to say that, uh, and, and as I mentioned previously, um, when it came to um, events or projects or stuff like that, we were quite inhibited by, uh, by uh, COVID this year. So only a small amount of expenditures in, uh, with relation to um, uh, 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 our seedlings and from that we uh, distributed through uh, Quinty Conservation of about $200. So that being said, um, we're in the black this year, uh, and we are um, a volunteer organization, a nonprofit organization. So we're not in this to be making money, but uh, you know, we also don't uh, want to be bleeding funds either. So uh, it's happy to say that uh, we're in the black this year, uh, just over $300. So um, I guess uh, it's kind of hard with this many people to uh, ask for comments or questions, but uh, I guess uh, one thing that we do need to do is um, uh, at all of our meetings, we need to pass uh, or not the, uh, uh, the treasurer's report. There needs to be... Um, an acceptance of this as it is. Um, so, um, so if that's okay, Dave, I'll just uh, call then for um, somebody to make a motion to accept this year's treasurer's report. Somebody willing to do that? You can unmute yourself if you are. I will make a motion to pass this year's treasurer's report. And that's Stephanie. Do we have a seconder for that motion? I second it, Susan, it's Amanda. And that's Amanda, terrific. Uh, so the way we'll do it is just ask if there's, if, is there anyone who actually has an objection to anything about the treasurer's report being accepted as given? And I don't hear any answers, so we'll take that as agreement and therefore the um, treasurer's report is passed. Thank you. And. Um, as uh, it's been mentioned or, or on, the, on the slide regarding memberships, you have my uh, email address there. So if anyone has any questions or, or comments and, or would like more information on any of that information, um, by all means, just send me an email and uh, I'd be happy to respond. 
Okay. Thanks very much for all that, Dave. It's great to get all the uh, to let everybody know how, what our financial position is. So I think we're all fine with that. And I'm just um, have a very Susan. I just yeah. wondered uh, maybe you could say Dave could say the benefit of having the family membership. Isn't right. that for Isn't that for voting? Well, it is for voting purposes. You're right, yeah. uh, Elizabeth. So. Um, with respect to our memberships, um, we do offer both an individual membership for uh, $20 or a family membership, um, which costs $30. And the family membership, or sorry, I guess the individual membership allows that individual one vote uh, for any business that arises at our AGMs, um, at our annual general meetings. Uh, for issues concerning Friends of the Salmon River and the direction we're taking, et cetera. So if there is a vote called, uh, that individual gets one vote. A family membership uh, entitles two votes for any of these issues related uh, that may come up at our annual general meetings and, and is looking for the membership support. I hope that is uh, clear. Okay, so thanks for that. Twenty dollars for twenty dollars for individual memberships and thirty dollars for family memberships uh, provide which provide two votes uh, on issues. Right. Yep, that's great to get that clear. And um, and there are times, for instance, when we were voting in a new constitution, when in fact uh, you know there was fairly important um, decisions being made at an AGM. So uh, Cor that correct. didn't that come up. Yeah. It doesn't happen too often, but it does happen from time to time. Or if there is some, you know, if there happened to be something that the uh, the membership brought forward and um, needed the board to debate and and um, and deal with, then uh, that would be a time when we'd ask the membership for votes. Correct. Okay. If everybody's okay on the membership question, I will go on to the last bit of our um, fairly brief on the um, President's report. Um, and just a couple of highlights. The Shoreline Restoration Program was a, um, a big program, partnered uh, Watersheds Canada and Quinney Conservation with some of our smaller groups like FSR. Um, just to give you an example, in this past season, uh, 11,000 tree shrubs and wildflowers were planted in eastern Ontario, so fairly impressive. And you can see some of the smaller uh, plantings in um, our two watersheds. It's ongoing. Lo landowners uh, for planting are still needed for 2022, including large properties. If you are in the Quinty watershed, so that's the Salmon, the Napanee, and the Moira rivers, you can contact Quinty Conservation. There's Maya's email. If you're in the Cataractway watershed, which is um, Kingston area, as well as Hay Bay and Wilton Creek, you can contact Natural Edge. That, in fact, is the official name of the program at Watersheds Canada. So that is the um, email of the project. Um, if you want to know a bit more about that, oops, uh, you can also see the Shoreline Restoration Seminar, which um, the manager of the program gave in our speaker series last season. Um, to watch it, you can just go to, for instance, to the FSR website, choose video presentations, and you'll find it, or go to the Friends in Napanee website, pull down the news tab, and you will also find it um, if you want more information about how that works. Quick little update on the intensive farm hog uh, operation in Aaronsville because it was mentioned at last um, AGM and the legal action is long over by now and the operation was actually scaled down to a much smaller operation which is in one sense good but also not so good because now it does not require um, very requires very little oversight um, especially from Stone Mills Township. Um, one of the good things to come from this um, project, I guess you call it, this development, uh, was that the, the citizens group, um, concerned citizens group, is still working with Stone Mills Township um, to bring about public input and consultation for any of these kinds of developments in the future. And lastly, we did um, 
uh, attack some uh, uh, invasive species this last couple of years. We actually did a big um, removal of Phragmites from the shoreline of Beaver Lake, so that's um, you know uh, middle of the watershed. Um, actually, I think I have that date wrong. I think it was two years ago. I think we did it actually in 2019. Uh, and we had quite a big group of people, and they came and helped us with the removal. And um, Amanda Tracy, our biologist, who you just met, uh, also did a presentation on invasive species and their management. So as follow-up, this just this last October, just a few weeks ago, um, we did a smaller group, just a smaller board group, um, because of COVID, et cetera and did a removal of the remaining Phragmites, which was only about half what was originally there. So that's actually considered pretty good because it is so invasive. Uh, and this spring, we also planted a number of shrubs there as remediation. So we report that this to the township, and we um, will continue to monitor it with Amanda's help. And one more little feature is that this last May, we actually um, it, members, Friends of Salmon River members, planted 266 seedlings um, as part of the uh, Quinty Conservation um, seedling, spring seedling program. And, and we usually do that every year, offer seedlings to people so they can plant um, in our watershed. And I think that actually brings us to the end of our um, AGM and our presentation. Um, and if you have any questions about anything, uh, obviously, uh, Dave gave you his email. If it's financial stuff, if you know, have any other general questions, you can certainly um, direct them to me. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, it was great to see so many people. And we definitely look forward to seeing you at the next event on Tuesday, December 7th. Good night, everyone. I also just want to quickly thank Susan very much for all of her time and effort putting together this AGM and everybody else involved. Um, it was definitely an undertaking with coordinating and getting the registrations all together. And thanks to Stephen uh, for using his account and managing the registrations as well. So thanks very much to everybody else who participated and helped out with tonight. Great. And lastly, in a day or two, everybody will receive the um, recording of this presentation so that you can uh, share it with friends. Thank Thanks. you.